Hello, everybody, and welcome to the ninth episode of 20-something Live. As always, we brought three incredible young entrepreneurs to give you the best advice on the entertainment industry. Our last guest today is going to be Kevin Tancherowin, who has directed movies such as Fame. He's danced with NSYNC. He's produced for the band, and he's also done music videos, too, for my very own Corella. We also have my good friend Talia Davies, all the way on the other side of the globe, down under in Australia. Um, in addition to providing the best hospitality that Australia has to offer, her company Totem One Love, where she is a touring agent, which is their term for talent buyer. Um, she does that for one of the biggest festivals in the world by the name of Stereo Sonic, which was recently acquired by SFX. And she's also done tours for the likes of the biggest names in dance music, including, including Swedish House Mafia. And I'll be getting to our first guest here in a second, but um, I want to start with two special announcements. The first is that we will be giving away a pass today to EDM Biz in Las Vegas. I'm so grateful for Insomniac for actually recognizing the success of this live stream and the amazing audience that you guys have been. They've actually given us our own panel at the event. And if you'd like to win a ticket to come see me and a few of our other past guests of 20-something live, you can do that just by hashtagging 20-something live on Twitter and letting me know what it means to you. And we'll be choosing one winner to come see us next week at EDM Biz in Las Vegas. It's a great networking event. You get to meet a lot of cool people and learn more about the industry and maybe figure out how you can fit into it. And the second announcement I want to make is I want to start with our book of the week today. It's Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. Um, and the reason I want to bring it up is because I know that a lot of people watching, we're all into self-improvement and being the best that we can be. And this book talks a lot about how one cornerstone habit can change your life. So if you're having any struggles out there or having success and want to be better, um, always can start with one cornerstone habit. If it's something even as small as making the bed or exercising for 15 minutes a day, you'd be shocked how it can improve other areas of your life. And if you want to learn more about that, please pick up Power of Habit. And now to our first guest, we have Ben Hebert, who with a company by the name of Gift Card Rescue, him and his partner Kwame, um, actually created this business and Kwame was debuted it on the first season of Shark Tank. He also started the blog White Raver Rafting, which brings up some of the best and most controversial news in dance music. And now he currently owns and started a company called Natural Stacks that provides supplements. And actually one of those supplements named Bulletproof Coffee by Dave Asprey, something that I drink every morning. So let's welcome Ben to the show. Jake, how's it going, man? What's Happy going on, Ben? Welcome. Uh, where are you where are you coming in from? I actually just moved to Austin, Texas. Really excited to be here. Great music scene. Uh, very young culture and a lively uh, business environment. A ton of startups here. So I'm really pumped. How did you decide on Austin? Well, actually, my girlfriend ended up getting a job here. I kind of told her a couple cities that I wanted to go to uh, because with my businesses, they're totally location independent. Uh, as long as I have a good office, I can work from anywhere, good Wi-Fi connection. Austin was top on the list. She got an awesome job, so we're here. Sounds. It looks like your office is furnished and ready to go. So <laughs> it took a little bit to set up, but yeah. I have more white walls in my house than I know what to do with, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> so I think that where we should begin is that it's so important with 20-somethings to, to know where somebody got their start, because if you recognize where somebody got their start, you can figure out how to get yours. So. Let's, is Gift Card Rescue where we begin? Yeah, I, I think that's the best way to kind of explain the whole story. You know, coming up, I had just transferred from Coastal Carolina. It was like 2009, so the recession hit. I wanted to go back to an in-state school, and I was kind of lost, just like everyone else is. You know, always had really big dreams of what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go, but no real way to attain them. Uh, I ended up finding the job at giftcardrescue.com, uh, off of Craigslist, actually, you can find some cool stuff on there. And I started out, yeah, I started out as an intern, uh, and it was there where I first really started to learn how the internet works, how internet business works. And as things started to grow, uh, I was invited to come and join the company as the first full-time employee. Then after that, we hit the Shark Tank, and you know, long story short, it's now I think number 138 or something on the Inc. 500 you know, top companies or top privately held companies in America. And so explain a little bit about what it does for everybody watching. 
Gift Card Rescue is a startup uh, e-commerce company, and basically we were creating a secondary market for gift cards. So if you think of like a used video game or something like that, it's kind of similar, but it's like you have $100 to Walmart, you hate Walmart, so we buy it from you for 80 resell it for 90 and make money on the spread. Makes sense. Cool, cool. Mm -hmm. And you said that it, during that process, when you were first getting started, you learned a lot about the Internet. It's very vague, and I realize that the solutions <laughs> that you can use, you know, eventually become probably what you use to, you know, work right river rafting and then later market natural stacks now. So what were some of those early things you learned about the Internet that have really been able to help you in your next startups? Well, I, I think coming on, and one of the most important things to me that I do is uh, user experience. So not so much from a design side, because I'm not a designer, but when someone comes and they interact with my brand, they interact with my website, they buy something, every time you run into contact with that person, whether it's a blog or an email or a Facebook update, you know, that's a touch point. And whether they acknowledge it or not, they're taking something away from that. So you're able to really craft something unique by making those touch points something special and different than uh, what other companies do. Uh, and as far as the internet goes, I mean, I learned a lot more. When you first start the online game, you have no idea how blogs work with stores, how you know email lists work, how any of that works. And you think you have an idea, but really you have no clue. So, I mean, if you're listening and you're young out there, get some experience somewhere else. There's tons of awesome startups hiring all over. A lot of the jobs are remote, too. Yeah, just start. Um, so, I, I love talking about touch points. I'm a huge fan of communication intelligence. I just think it's so important to understand the way that every touch point does matter. Um, I had an artist that wrote me an email yesterday, and she said, how come there's all these recording artists out there that have all these SoundCloud followers or Facebook fans and they can't tour? And there's so many different possibilities and reasons for that because there are so many touch points. So how, with your new company, Natural Stacks, do you capitalize on the fact that you're aware that all these touch points exist and what do you do to differentiate yourself? Something that we've been doing recently, um, you know, I'm very big into email because I'm sure a bunch of people out there listening are running Facebook pages or whatever, and your viewership is just like, you know, a percentage of what it used to be. They crush uh, us! <laughs> Damn you, Facebook, yeah. So, but with email, it's different than anything else because no matter what happens, your email's there. And you might not check it today, you might not check it tomorrow, but you're going to check it. And maybe you have 40 messages, so you're probably going to see some of them, you're going to click on some of them. So your chance to interact with someone is uh, a lot better there. So what we do that's specific at naturalstacks.com is when someone comes in and purchases something, depending on their action, uh, they're automatically going to get put into a different email chain. So our main product is Siltep. Uh, you purchase Siltep, you're going to get a thank you email. You're going to get a follow-up to make the experience better. And then other things as well along the way, depending on what you click on and things of that nature. And how many customers do you have so far with the site? We launched in uh, the middle of October. Uh, we've shipped over 5,000 orders. I'd probably say 40%, uh, 30 to 40% of them are international. Uh, we work with multiple wholesalers in the UK, Canada, Australia, working on Singapore and a couple other markets. So we were able to generate traction a lot faster than we thought but because we kind of always had the big grand vision, it wasn't something we were unprepared for. Interesting. And obviously this won't apply for international, but it, it's cool that you mentioned that relationship follow-up or the customer follow-up, if you will, because um, my roommate in college, he had an online delivery site, kind of like a localized version of a Grubhub or Delivery.com. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And what was so intriguing to me is that he would actually call every first-time customer or write them a handwritten thank you note. It was kind of one or the other. Um, as the founder of the business, and I think it really did help grow the business because around town people just started to get to know him, and it, it was really super awesome. So, how do you decide what products that that you sell on Natural Stacks? And tell me a little bit about Siltap. Well, that idea really came from uh, Tim Ferriss, Four Hour Work Week, Four Hour Body. You know, New York Times bestselling author talked about Siltap on his blog. He mentioned it in Wired, 
And the formula was just kind of out there on the web on this uh, forum called Longevity. And my partner, Roy Krebs, who actually uh, uh, used to be in the dance music space, he had a supplement called Rave Aid. It was around for a while, but he actually yeah, sold it. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> He, yeah, he was like the silent partner behind there. But anyway, he hey, saw the sounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he saw the opportunity because uh, it was completely open source, but there was literally like years of people talking about this stack, how it helped them, how it benefited them. So we got a small production run made, tested it ourselves, sent it out to some other people, and then eventually got in contact with the person who created Siltep. And this was incredibly important for our brand because what we were able to do was secure a registered trademark, which is absolutely vital whenever you're marketing something, uh, especially products in today's era. And through that, we kind of just said, let's go. And we started in probably March or April of 2013 launched in October, and then by the end of the year, we did 100,000 in sales. And what exactly is Siltep? Siltep is, uh, actually I actually have some right here. It's a, a nootropic, a natural nootropic that induces what's called long-term potentiation in the brain. Uh, as a college student, you know, most people are familiar with the Adderall, Five Vans, things of that nature, but a natural alternative is kind of necessary. Not everyone wants to, uh, you know, take a, a drug every time. Uh, the effects aren't as significant as that, but the way I like to explain it is if you're engaged with what you're doing and you're in the mindset where, you know, I have to do this work, it kind of clears everything up. We call it optimal mental performance, but it, it just puts you in a state where you're ready to work. And it's not like you're over-caffeinated or jittery or excited, but your head's just clear. If yeah, how does it work that, in the brain? How does it work in the brain? Mm -hmm. Do we lose him? I don't know where Ben went. All right, guys. Um, in that case, we're going to fast forward here a little bit and get to our next guest. Um, as I mentioned, she is a talent buyer out of Australia, and she works for a company by the name of Total One Love, and they throw one of the greatest dance music festivals in the world and one of the greatest countries in the world, Australia, my good friend Talia Davies. Oh, I'm back. Ben is back. All right. Sorry, sorry about that. I, I clicked. Talia, I'm going to have to save that intro again for you. We're going to okay. have about five more minutes here with Ben. Uh, so where were we, Ben? Uh, we're talking about Silta. And basically the two main ingredients, and I'll go quickly here, are artichoke extract and forskolin, uh, not to be confused with foreskin. And basically, <laughs> yeah, I, I, get, I get that a lot. Uh, Is that foreskin in a bottle? Uh, not not yeah. quite. It, it's, a, it's a flower from India, but I, it sounds the same, doesn't it? Okay. <laughs> but the artichoke extract uh, inhibits PDE4 where the forskolin uh, activates and increases levels of C-amp in the brain, which then induces long-term potentiation. I uh, was talking to Wade earlier. The third brain offices is going to get stacked up on natural stacks after this, and when uh, you guys sign some more crazy artist deals and uh, break something through, no, I expect my kickback or something. Since, since a bulletproof coffee while you're at it, we go through that like crazy. Oh, you know, yeah. I've never, drink, I've never drank coffee in my life, and I was at Summit Series last year, about probably 10 months ago, and this guy, Dave Asprey, who you're in business with, started talking about the way our body reacts to diet and food, and he was just so incredibly incredibly knowledgeable. I mean, the guy is... Oh, he's, yeah, a, he's a genius. He's a mind. He's a trip, because he, you know, he's wearing orange glasses after 6 p.m. every day, so he can go to bed earlier. It's crazy. Like, I, you know, <laughs> I, I can't get on that level, and somebody asked at the end. I was just incredibly fascinated. never seen anything like it. And at the end, somebody asked, he said, if you could do one thing today, what would you do? And, of course, he was selling his coffee, and he said, and he thinks coffee is one of the most important things that we can digest every day. And I know there's a lot of conflicting studies, and I don't know where I stand on it, but from that day forward, I've never drinking a cup of coffee in my life. I bought his cup of coffee, and now every morning my assistant makes me a cup of Bulletproof coffee. And I, you know, it just become part of my daily routine. And I kind of go back and forth on 
whether or not your brain actually like it helps you stay focused. But then if you're in the habit, if you're addicted to the caffeine, do you ever feel like you just have to have it to be even, so to say? And that's kind of where I'm at where I don't know whether um, – you know, it's actually helpful or just an addiction? Well, I, I think you have a lot of things going on there. I mean, the power of routine is, you know, incredibly strong. You look at all the best athletes in the world, you know, they pretty much do the same thing every day. They eat the same thing. I think Michael Phelps listened to the, the same thing. Power of habits. Book. Yeah, the power I'm of habits, exactly. He's in his book. It's is he? Michael Phelps routine. I, have, I haven't read that one yet. Uh, but he, he listened to the same mix before every warm-up, before every meet. So I think one by doing that is very powerful, but also what's going on with Bulletproof Coffee is you're combining those healthy fats in there and your body's burning that off as energy. And it's kind of like, the best way to put it is everything we've been told about fats is a lie, sugar is terrible for you, and when you drink the Bulletproof Coffee in the morning, you know, you feel great and then you eat lunch around one or two, it's like, it's one of the best things that ever happened to me as well. <laughs> Cool. So how do you go about growing your business now? You're an entrepreneur. You have this business. You guys have done 5,000 orders. What's the next step? Uh, the next step for us is really growing the brand. And what does growing the brand mean? That means talking about Siltep wherever we can, talking about natural stacks, telling the story of the company. Um, we'll see whether we do an endorsement, raise a round. We have a lot of different options right now, but because we're profitable, we're not really rushing one way or the other. And you're selling uh, third-party products. You're not making your own products, correct? No, they're all they're all custom made in-house or not in-house. We actually manufacture uh, in California. They're all custom formulas designed by us. And what's different about Natural Stacks compared to every other company out there is we're entirely open source. And this has been one of the main reasons we've been able to break through to people at. Google, Apple, Facebook, you know, a lot of uh, the big tech companies because as far as the advancements go with supplements, you know, there's been nothing, you know, that's crazy uh, that's really come out. You know, all, all the things that have been around forever are still good for you in the best form possible uh, unless it's like a drug. So what we do is we combine the best ingredients we label it clearly, tell you exactly how much is in there, so you know what exactly and how much you're putting into your body. Uh, if you look at a lot of like the pre-workouts or other supplements, you'll find at GNC, you'll see some like crazy rage proprietary formula with like 20, 30 ingredients. You have no idea what any of that is. Rave aid, like, baby. <laughs> yeah, you'd need like three doctorates to decipher it, and we just break that down. Our products have like five to seven ingredients in them total, you know how much. And because of that, people can do their own research, they know exactly what's in it, and they're like, wow, this is a premium product, you know, I'm going to buy it. Yeah, the habits of, of buying supplements or vitamins or you know, anything that's, if, if healthy for you, I mean, even if it's not, though, the habits are just insane, you can build a great business for yourself. Uh, I heard about a company recently called Urban Remedy that does juices straight to your door, I'm going to check that out some Getting, ever since I moved to California, it's like juice everywhere around here. Um, just I have, I have my Ninja Blender right out there. You, you've got to get one of them or a Vitamix or a something. A year it costs basically the same amount of money to make your juices as it does to buy it. I mean, they're expensive, but by the time you put so many vegetables and fruits in there, by the time you do it and you get any juice, yeah, it's yeah. the same amount of money. It's definitely a lot easier to buy them, but sometimes it's like, you know, you just go to the fridge, like, oh, I'm going to throw the kale in there, I'm going to throw, you know, some apples, I mean, whatever, and just get crazy. Can never Sometimes get too much kale. It's terrible, though. Oh, you got to right, get into so kale. I got, I got a couple minutes left here with you. I just want to hear a little bit about why you started White River Rafting. I know you guys have broken some of the craziest, most controversial stories in dance music. You guys have kind of been one of the <laughs> left field blogs that really has put yeah. an editorial twist on the genre. And I just want to hear a little bit about it. Is that kind of a side hobby for you? Um, have you ever thought about making that more of a more of a main gig? Are you just a big dance fan? How did it start? Where is it today? And where is it going? It, it definitely started as just loving the music and connecting with it on such a level that I was just like, I have to share this with people. It's like you hear something so, so good, you need to play it for people. Well, I was going to do that through the blog. 
And back when I started White River Rafting in like 2011-ish, that's what all blogs were. I mean, blogs were just about music. They weren't really about the stories. They weren't about the editorials. You didn't have to go on a blog and read 10 things you need to bring to the rave this weekend <laughs> or, or whatever. So I saw the opportunity after Ultra 2012 that, you know, wow, this thing can get a little bit bigger if I take it more seriously. And for a time, um, all of my energy and resources were kind of pushed into it. And like you said, you know, we did break a lot of stories and we've pushed a lot of things because I think we've always considered ourselves to be like the wild, wild west of like rave blogs because the name's White Raver Rafting. You have to be fun with it. We have to take jokes at things. But at the same time, it's like you have this platform to share things. And if you want to talk about something, you know, talk about it. Freedom of speech. And that's always been our mentality. And that's why all my guys, my entire team, they're just awesome. Cool. Awesome. Well, keep up the great work. I always enjoy, like I said, the editorial twist. And good luck to you with Natural Stacks. I'm sure that if we get some test products here in the Third Brain household, we'll be putting oh, yeah. in the purchase orders right away. So I'm excited <laughs> to try Siltap. Look more into it because it's always so scary to try those things for the first time. And um, it's cool that you guys break it down to just really the natural organic ingredients. Good luck at your new home in Austin. And I'll be sure to hit you up when I'm down there. Thanks, man. Cool. So, guys, Ben was just speaking of breaking stories, and I think that now is the time to let you know a little bit about the tune of the week. Uh, one of my artists, Zoo, recently had the pleasure of remixing officially one of the greatest female artists of our era currently, Lana Del Rey, and his remix of West Coast came out today. And apparently, while we're in this live stream, I, I got a note here from somebody that works with me that his remix of London Grammar has leaked as well, so I don't know how that happened, but um, it's phenomenal, so if it did, I guess it's out there already. There's nothing we could do about it, so be sure to go check that. Um, and now I think I've already given her a couple, couple introductions, but one of my really good friends, Talia Davies. Hey, Talia. Hello. Hi, how are that you? Work? Hi, good morning. I didn't know that Google <laughs> Hangout works in Australia. I've just joined it. I have no idea either. I'm surprised you can actually hear me all the way up there. I'm friends with so many Aussies, and I don't think I've ever had anybody from Down Under on the show yet. I feel very privileged. You're representing yes. an entire country of people right now. It's not a big country to represent. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on with you? I'm um, just working on stereo. We've got um we've got lineup coming out next month, and so we're deep in contracting land and making sure it's all 100 percent. And how would you explain? Because I think a lot of the people tune in are from America. How would you explain Stereosonic to somebody in America? You know, before you guys had booked Corella and I came over there and got to experience it for the first time. Um, you know, it just I didn't know. First off, I didn't know what it was, and then second off, when I see this amazing um, teaser video for what it was and our name on it. You know, I'm thinking, okay, this is another dance festival, but there's definitely some things that you guys do that I think separate you as a company from a lot of other dance music touring companies. Definitely. We have quite a unique market down here where we are, we're such a big country, but everything's so spread out. So when you come down here and you're flying for 14, 20 hours, you actually need to make the most of it. So we... Instead of just doing one festival like EDC or Electric Zoo over one weekend, we hit five different markets and do it over two weeks. Um, so we've got, we hit the main cities in Australia, which is Sydney, Adelaide, Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth. Um, and they, so essentially it's like a big school camp and 350 people touring on it and two weeks of just, just hanging out and, and playing festivals. I know that there's a lot of managers, agents, artists that watch the show, and I think that for anybody watching, if you don't know about Stereosonic, you need to hit up Talia immediately because it's exactly as she described it. I mean, I remember being on the bus for the first time with all of our peers. It was kind of the first time. You know, you go to these festivals, you have a trailer, you're in and you're out in America, but with stereo, you're traveling on the same planes, you're at the same hotels, the day's off, you're in the studio with these artists, and it really is an incredible experience, especially for young artists that are still getting uh, initiated into the scene. I think Stereosonic is that perfect initiation. So definitely go to Australia and do it with Talia. I think that's one of the things that we do best, as you said, hospitality. We um we put a lot of a lot of small artists with bigger artists and like with the girls, you end up doing these collaborations that you would never have 
had a chance to do otherwise because you are in and out at other festivals. Um, I think it was was it Gareth Emery that the girls did down under. They got, got in touch with them and and you spend a week with them, so you get to know their music and you get to hang out with their agents and all of these amazing things happen from from coming on this tour. And I think that we've kind of done it better than anyone else has done it. That's why we've been so successful recently. Yeah, it's been growing like crazy. I mean, I can even tell I've been there, guys, for you know the past two years, and I hope to be back for a third. And it's really incredible to see how it's grown, and I think it's just really resonating with Australian culture. You guys are so in tune with what the Australians want. Well, last year we actually, as you know, we expanded to two days, so we now hit. We still hit the five cities over the two weekends, but on any given time we have two festivals running in two different cities in two different states. We fly people in between them, and on the on the Hey guys, I think that we are temporarily lost Tally here for a second. Give us one second. All right. Um, shall we bring our third guest? I think we're going to fast forward here a little bit. Seems like for the first time in the history of 20-something, we're having an issue or two. But um, we don't even have to bring him in via a camera. She's we actually, back? I don't know if she's coming back. It doesn't look like it. But we have the man, the myth, the legend himself right here. I've never met a guy that's more multidimensional or does more amazing creative things than this man right here, everybody. Welcome, Kevin Tancherowen. How you doing? Kevin, what's up, buddy? It's not one of these anymore. Oh, yeah, I guess not, right? Yeah. <laughs> so what's going on? Uh, not much. It was oh, maybe I do. Maybe it's the microphone. No, I think the microphone's right there. Cool. Oh, can you hear? Yeah, yeah. well. It's been kind of a <laughs> Oh, my gosh. That cannot happen. Where is that coming from? Okay. Yeah, there we go. Cool. That's been kind of a busy day with E3 going on in downtown, but I came from the... You know what E3 is? Yeah, the of course. Video, yeah. played last year with Machinima. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I was supposed to go to that, and for some reason I got too tired because I'm too old, but... Uh, You're yeah, I came for, I'm, I mean, for staying out really late after a long day, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot to ask for me. Um, but yeah, no, it's cool to be here. Yeah, welcome. So talk to us a little, so what are you doing specifically with E3 right now? Um, I actually had a couple meetings with some of the video game people, uh, potentially working with Microsoft on a, on a pretty secretive project. All the video game stuff is super secretive. Of course. So meeting with them, and I met with a couple VFX people, and then um, also I met up with some of the Mortal Kombat people. Awesome. And have you worked in the video game space before? Well, with Mortal Kombat, uh, a couple years ago, I did a live-action version of Mortal Kombat, and we did a couple of seasons of the digital series, which ended up being like... That's how we found you first. That's right, yeah. I think your girl came back. Hello? She's back. Um, I'm we're gonna, back. We're going to come back to you? Yeah, right, come back. Okay, you sure? Yeah. Right. Sorry. We're just jumping. We're just jumping to and fro. This today. is the Australian internet for you. <laughs> yeah, what is up with that? I don't know. The internet doesn't come all the way down here. You don't work for a startup anymore, Tal. You work for a major company. You guys gotta get that get that taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all the messy. Um, I think we lost you. You were talking about how you guys expanded to two days, and how you guys have a festival going on one side of the country, another side of the country at the same time, which is obviously a little bit different than America, where you could have EDC New York and EDC Las Vegas, but they're going on obviously not even the same month. So. Um, yeah. or I'll let you take it from there. Well, we don't have the luxury of bringing people back again, so we really need to get everything out in the first two weeks. It is really um, far. That is what it, is. it is really far. <laughs> and considering how many times I've been to America this year, I do that trip a lot of times. Um, but yeah, we don't want to keep bringing people out every every few weeks, so everything done at once. Um, and being able to expand to two days is really. We've brought out genres of music that Australians wouldn't otherwise get to see, like drum and bass and and a lot of trance. We're big trance fans down here. And techno, the really cool techno kids. We had um, the Hot Natured crew do Hot Creation Stage last year. And these sort of things wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been able to expand to two days. That's um, really worked in our favour, being able to have such a large audience down here. And we also... 
I mentioned to you how in tune you guys are with Australian culture. What do you think is the best way for an artist to get your attention? Not by hitting you up, but actually via their art. Like what exactly? Because you are the person in charge ultimately of booking many of these acts for the festival. So how does somebody go about getting your attention? What are you looking for? What have you seen recently that really fascinates you? Um, I actually look at a lot of different markets. I look at to America for the whole EDM thing, the explosion over there. I think it's nice to look at emerging markets and then you go back and look at the UK markets and you try to find somewhere in between because a lot of a lot of talent up until the past 24 months has actually come from the US and the UK. And recently, Australia has kind of found its own identity with Melbourne Bounce, with the success of Will Sparks and Joel Fletcher. Um, so I go out a lot. I go to a lot of festivals, I go to a lot of clubs, and I try to vary it around. I'll go to a techno club, I'll go to a trance club, I'll go to Sydney and see another live event from one of our competitors. I'll I'll just try to vary it a lot and take other people's opinions and then bring it all together. And if someone says, I really like this artist, I'll take five minutes to check it out, skim through it. Um, and that's what all the other touring agents do here. We all specialize in one genre, but we'll listen to other things and we'll take other people's advice. I think that's one of the biggest things is you've got to actually be able to listen to your peers and say, and not be big headed and say, this is it's actually really good music and thanks for passing it on. Uh -huh. I think a lot of people have been unsuccessful because they have only stuck with the music that they specifically like and they don't see the, the appeal to the general public. So is it all based on live, or do you look to the internet as well, or the blogs that you follow? I, well, I do look to the internet as well. Um, SoundCloud, I love SoundCloud, and I love the feature that that it keeps streaming different artists. Once you listen to one thing, and it finds finds other things. I found so much music that way. Um, I'm a big fan of Spotify. I I pay for my subscription. We all pay for our music here. We're, we 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 don't pirate any music in in Australia. Um, at but all? The, the whole country? <laughs> well, we're not as strict as France, but I think we're heading that way. Um, yeah, well, we try to... Well, we've also got the label, One Love, so we, we've kept, like, we're like we quite big into paying for music. Um, but when it comes to... when it, I, I personally look at social media. I'm really bad. I just... I go to Facebook and I'll take the... the, the most up-to-date SoundCloud that they've got the mix. And I'll, listen, I'll skim through it and listen to what it is. And then if I like it, I'll go back and listen to the rest of the stuff. But it's, I think for, for artists that are trying to get our attention, to always make sure that you update your social media links. That is really important because a lot of people don't have, they don't have a social media presence that's going to grab someone's attention. If you are making really good music, you're playing really good sets, how am I going to hear that? I say I'm going to Sydney this weekend, so I'm not hearing someone that's in Melbourne this weekend. So record that set, upload it, let send me a link, and and if I like it, I'll I'll keep listening to your stuff, and then we'll book you. That's how everyone's. How everyone? Sorry, what? Was, I'll do. That's how. That's actually with the girls with Cruella. That's how you you hear one song. You're like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah, because you you guys are absolute geniuses when it comes to publicity and marketing and being able to get your stuff out there to your fans. Thank you so much. That's very very kind of you. Um, we actually have a question from the audience. Many new artists coming from Australia lately. Who's your favorite new artist from your market? Oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say. Why not? I have um, because <laughs> they're all my friends. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to the Aston Shuffle because their album this year is absolutely amazing. It is one That's of my favorite. That's the one that already came out, correct? Yes, it's just come out, and it's um, and they are quite unique in the fact that they play live. Um, that's, this album's been two years in the making and I, I'm massive fans of theirs and they're very good friends but mostly the music is fantastic if you haven't heard it you need to listen to it um, I like Golden Features um, I like I actually really like the whole Melbourne Bounce movement I think it's um, it's kind of put Australia on the map in a way that we weren't before and people it's it's so cool being in in Pasha in in New York and people are going oh my god I love like Will Sparks and and you're going yeah he's awesome. bad he's from <laughs> I'm working on it um, it's it's kind of it's kind of cool to know that my hometown is now famous for something aside from being in the middle of nowhere. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think that over the past two years, having visited twice, I'm seeing this increasing 
cultural infusion to America, to the UK as well, from artists that are breaking. I mean, even take an artist like Zoo breaking first in Australia. It's so intriguing to me. Um, Zoo how... is huge down here. I love it. <laughs> um, it's, you know, you guys actually give me the reason, the passion to, to love it, to actually understand what that means to be huge in your country, because I've been there twice, thanks to you. So it's like, that's such an honor. And I think there's something going on down there. So what is it? Why do you think all of a sudden Australia is having such a cultural impact on the rest of the world? Um, well, I think the rest of the world is kind of cottoned on to the fact that we've been doing this for a very, very, very long time. We've been doing this the EDM thing has just exploded in America, but Australia's been doing it for two decades. So we've got festivals like Big Day Out, um, and uh, now we've got Listen Out, and Stereosonic, obviously, my baby. Um, and we've been going for that many years, and we've kind of perfected it. We've, we've found our, our audience, we know what they want, and we're, we take it to the people. Um, whereas you've got these festivals that are in the first, you know, two or three years, and they they're still trying to find their feet. We have the most amazing directors here who just bring like decades and decades of experience, and that's why because we've been able to perfect that that formula. I think that's when you why say directors, you're talking about the, the directors of the festival. Yes, the festival directors. So we've got Dora Rez, who um who has a wealth of knowledge. We've got Simon Coyle, who is is one of the most famous touring agents in, in the world um, and we've got an amazing production team that, that work on that work on festivals globally and that they've come to us and we've just got such a good team and everyone wants to work here because it's a, it's a good environment to work in and we're able to take a good product to the people. Cool and how there's not a whole lot of female talent buyers out there so how did you get your start and how did you become, I mean, it's one thing to start as an intern or an assistant or an artist relations person, but then to actually become a talent buyer, it's a pretty big accomplishment for such an incredible festival. So what was that progression like? And, you know, how did you feel like being a female helped you, hindered you in any way? Or Well, actually, when we, when I first, I've been here for nearly five years now. Um, and when, so I've worn many, many hats in my progression in the company. Um, and when I first when I first started here, I didn't know necessarily which avenue I wanted to take. I love working with artists, and that's um, being a talent buyer in Australia is not just buying talent for one event. It's it's working on a partnership with an artist and and with their agents globally to figure out what's the best move for, for that artist for the next few years or the next few tours, and um, because we can only hit this audience once or twice. So it's I think that's why we call it a, t um, a touring agent instead of talent buyer because we aren't just buying the talent. Um, I started I studied music, and in my final year of music, this job came up, and I actually didn't think in a million years I was going to get it. I'd been working in events since I was a teenager. Um, and I, I went for it, and I, I there were no girls that worked for this company. Everyone was, you know, thirty plus, and um, I got the role. So I just, and I've just naturally progressed throughout the company. But I've, I've done things like administration and artist liaison, and and I've written code for our website, and I've just got because I started when we were still quite a small company. Um, I've been able to to find different areas and and generate all of this wealth of knowledge, which I think um, I wouldn't have got if I had just started as a talent buyer. So I'm quite grateful. Yeah, I think when you're at a young company, learning every single division of what that company does is very um, important in order to have an impact long term with the company. So what was that progression like or what, I guess, what were those key things, you know, ways that you brought value, obviously being multidimensional, being able to do everything from coding a site to administration work, and then obviously being an incredible people person as you are, but was there any specific moments of value that you think that the directors really looked at and said, wow, you know, Talia really knows what she's talking about and is capable of executing on? Um, I think it's, it's a lot of things. It's a couple of years of being able to look at things like set times and know actually that artist doesn't go with that and being able to troubleshoot problems so problem like we have in the past I have been able to sit there and actually resolve it in the heat of the moment instead of looking to somebody else to say oh can I do it this way can I do it that way because I've just had that experience and now I know I know which ways to take it um, I don't think there was any specific point um, but they they just seem to 
to trust me <laughs> and um, trust my experience and trust my judgment. And who are some of your favorite acts that you've booked and sort of watched get really big in Australia um, via the work that your company's done? Obviously, it's, like you said, it's a partnership. It's not just you bringing them in front of that audience, but who are some of your favorite acts that you've been able to watch grow over the past few years? Definitely one of my favorites is Cruella because, as you know, first tour you don't have down to under. Do that. I, it actually it actually is because one of the first tour down under, as you know, it wasn't. A, it was coming from such a big market in America to a small market, and then the next year being able to see the natural progression with them and, and make, making them bigger. And I love that. I love seeing artists that we help to to bring to a different market and help grow and develop. Um, so aside from Cruella, uh, Destructo, who we work with, he's um, he's he's pretty big and watching. Every year he comes out and does a hard stage, which is pretty cool. Um, was this with Gary earlier? With Gary's, yeah. Um, uh, brought, we had Skrillex one year as well, which was really cool, being able to work with him. And um, I'm, I'm, I can't really pick favorites. Every year I've got a couple of favorites. <laughs> People that you champion through the system. Yeah, I like the small guys and I like the big guys too. I um, and I like all different types of music. Last year we had Noiser and Farm Beggars, a collaborative show um, as I'm Legion, which was fantastic. It was one of the greatest things I think I've ever seen. So being able to do stuff like that really makes makes me happy and makes me proud to do my job. Do you have a video of that? I'd love to see it. I we do actually. Um, yeah, I'll so um, shoot one over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so obviously you guys expanded to being from a one-day festival to becoming a two-day festival. Are there any other plans of expansion for Stereosonic or Totem One Love over the next couple of years? Uh, you're going to have to stay tuned for that one. Okay. And we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Talia. Thanks um, for having me. I hope to see me. you either in America or back in Australia later this year. You Thanks will. You us. will. Okay. See you. All right, guys, remember that you can win a pass to see the 20-something live panel as well as all the rest of the panels in Vegas next week. It's a $400 pass or $500, something crazy like that. It's expensive, so if you want to get one free, just hashtag 20-something live and tell us what it means to you, and we'll be sure to hook you up with that. And now back with back with Kevin over here. It's going to be really awkward for me to talk to you like this. Here, no, I'm, no, taking, no, these, good, good. I'm taking these off. I like it. Here we are. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So like I said, I was beginning to get into um, you are incredibly multidimensional as a creative, as a business person, really, as a talent. So where did that where did that all begin? And uh, it actually started as a kid, I was very hyperactive, so my parents ended up putting me in a lot of like extracurricular things to burn energy, so I wasn't causing hell at home. So I ended up, <laughs> so they put me in like piano lessons, Asian karate class, very Asian, <laughs> and then they put me in dance class, which was like an anomaly. I know right now, like a lot of Asian guys dance hip hop, but back then it was like an anomaly. So I went to hip hop class, and somehow because my sister was also a hip hop dancer and I would mimic her all the time, I was able to pick up some of the choreography. So that was like the first kind of I guess, creative artistic thing that I did, besides piano. And when I became around like 10 to 12, I started kind of like auditioning for fun, like why not make a little bit of money doing like Fox Kids advertisements or industrials for Reebok and whatnot. So I did that as a complete hobby. Then when I was like 14 or 15, I can't remember, like 1999, uh, my best friend at the time, his name was Wade Robson, he was a couple years older than me, he was a choreographer. And he said, hey, so I'm choreographing for this brand new artist, young girl. She is a pop singer. No one really knows about her right now. But she's going to be performing with this other group named NSYNC at the VMA. Her name is Britney Spears. Would you like to come and do that performance? And I'm not having really seen anything of hers. But this was around the time TRL was just kind of kicking in. So her video was just starting to come out. So this was before Baby One More Time. No, this, no, this was actually just as Baby One More Time was kind of cut, kind of got introduced. But when he asked me to come, come and dance for her, I hadn't seen the video. And then TRL, I think, premiered it, and then I was like, oh, yeah, okay, it was just like this really pretty girl with, uh, in, you know, with dancing in the hallways. I said, yeah, sure. 
let's go to New York and do this. So that was like my very first experience working with Britney and NSYNC. And then over the years, I started touring from the ages of like 15 to 17 with like this group in Sweden called the A-Teens who did like mm -hmm, of music with an Aaron Carter. So I saw like every worst part of America yeah. <laughs> at these like world county fairs. But, but the silver lining was I also got to tour Europe. But I never wanted to be a dancer. Like that wasn't my thing at all. Um, yeah, so what was going on in your brain during that time? I think that for so many um, successful young people, mm -hmm. you have this vision of the future. At this point, did you have a vision for how you were going to evolve from become, you know, from a dancer all the way to becoming a director? What did you I think mean, your future was going to be? I think as a, like as anyone who's creative growing up, you see multiple paths, right? There's so, so you kind of are schizophrenic with what you want to do unless you are just completely zeroed in. But growing up... I actually wanted to be a creature effects designer like Stan Winston and Rick Baker because I was obsessed with action figures and essentially making creature like effects Jurassic Park or with like a huge action figure. So I wanted to do that for a long time. I was studying that, but at the same time, I also was getting into musical equipment. So I like bought an MPC and like a Mackie mixer and like a Trinity keyboard and started learning how to kind of do that stuff. You know, this was the time like laptop didn't exist, so you couldn't just buy Ableton and, and like, complete and have everything in a box. Like, you had to route everything, and it was kind of complicated, but I was learning how to do it, and that was kind of, like, a fun thing that I did in my hotel room when all the older kids, because I was, like, one of the younger guys on tour, would go out and, like, party. So I was alone in my room. Uh, producing in headphones? Producing in headphones, yeah. Like good old Long life. before the days of the dubstep producers and headphones. It was basically just me pressing stuff on the MPC and trying to figure out how to use it. And you had the musical background from your experience as a piano from player? Piano, okay. yeah. But then, after the touring stuff, I kind of somehow got thrust into doing remixes for like live shows for NSYNC and Britney. I did some for Christina, which is like I mixed sound effects and maybe remixed their hit singles so that they would perform it at the Grammy or the Billboard Music Awards. Did you perform with them when you did those mixes? At that time, sometime. But I was trying to get out of being a dancer because it was not really something that I necessarily really wanted to do. So, but as I was leaving that, Brittany had asked me if I wanted to be her choreographer for a video called Me Against the Music that was with Madonna. You know, when you're 17, you don't say no. You're kind of like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that just kind of led to another thing, and then by the time I was 18, she asked me to direct her last tour, which was the Onyx Hotel tour. So I wrapped that when I was 19, and then I remember going home after being on the road. Are you still closer to now? Um, I haven't talked to her in a very long time. You know, obviously there was a lot of things that have happened since the time I left and the way she is now in Vegas, but I think I'm going to go and see the Vegas show and hopefully say hi. So... I reached out, um, but I haven't seen her in a very, very long time. But yeah, that's kind of, I left the tour directing gig when I was 19 because I was like, if I get sucked into this, I'm never leaving, you know? So that was the last and time. And you wanted to explore, obviously, other pursuits? I did, I did. I really wanted to kind of get back into what I wanted to do, which was getting into the future film world. Okay. Yeah. So I decided and to I, try to go there. So, I mean, sometimes... We get stuck in one industry or in the ritual, you know, obviously the book of the day being power of habit. Yeah. We, we kind of get stuck into this. Um, every day is the same day we're sure. seeing. And even if you stop something to start something new is a very difficult process. So you were young. You obviously weren't afraid of failure. So where did you begin um, as you endured, I'm sure, the wrath of the feature film business at first? Oh, yeah, because it was very, it's a very scary transition to kind of go from one – Thing to the next, but being, people say you're a dancer, you're a choreographer. Yeah, you get cornered. Like yeah. you, you, you either only do this and you only do that, you only do this genre. But I, at the time, I believed that the dance and music genre was kind of getting really popular within the TV and the film space. So I kind of like knew I had to use that. Right, that was my one edge up on getting into the feature film business. So I cut together all this B-roll that I shot on the road with with Britney, of like the dancers uh, having a good time and talking to camera, 
and I shot a couple things with some friends, and I cut together a sizzle reel that was about 10 minutes long that was essentially like a docu so reality show about backup dancers. And this was the time when, like, The Hills was popular, Laguna Beach was popular. So I... How long was it? It was, uh, when was it, you mean? Yeah. It was, it was like, 2005. Okay. So I sent that to my agent who somehow got it to J-Lo's company. And she responded immediately because a lot of people don't realize that her first job in the industry was a backup dancer. She was a fly girl for the show called In Living Color. Hmm. So she responded to it, attached herself as an executive producer, and then we sold that to MTV. So that was like my first in into like kind of the TV world, even though it was technically reality. And that was just the right to shoot a pilot. Yes. So we did a pilot called Dance Life. It was on. And then that got picked up for a full season, and we did that. And then from there, I... And you were you were stayed on board as the director? I did. I did. I stayed on you board. You were 22 as, years old? At the... 21. 21. 21. And no then, college. No college. There was, I mean, that was a hard decision because all my best friends were going off to college. What did your parents think? They just knew that I never stopped working, and they, they thought it would be a mistake for me to stop just to go to college and then roll the dice and see what happens after because they knew this is what I wanted it to do. It sounds like you had some incredible momentum. Yeah, that, so they, they realized that. It was a very tough decision, but they let me do it. Um, and then after that, I directed another reality show called The Search for the Next Pussycat Doll, which was like, I, I, you know, like, I am not a reality television guy by any means, but I did that one season, and it was, I would never probably want to do another competition reality show again, because it, you know, we've watched these things, they're pure exploitation, it's like, the directing is, go film that girl cry, crying in the corner, and, you know, like, it's not like a fulfilling thing at all. So I looked for a movie that I thought would be right, and uh, I went and met on a, uh, with this company called Lakeshore Entertainment, who was, at the time, remaking a movie called Fame. So I went in, and I pitched my heart out, basically saying, like, I kind of grew up knowing what the world of, you know, being a young artist is, and they attached me, and then that was my first movie in 2008, and that was with MGM. And you were just brought on straight director? director. Yeah, no writing or anything. I just directed. And then after that, I didn't want to. Did get they know at that time that that movie was going to be so big? But no, I don't think they knew. I think you know. I think it did very. It did better internationally than it did domestic. Um, and then this was a time when like the step up movies were about to come mm -hmm. out. And then I, I didn't want to be cornered into being like, oh, I'm the dance music guy, right? If it's a, if it's another dance driven movie, you know. I, that's all I will be considered for. So I went back to my like creature effects nerd boy mentality and picked up a couple cameras and spent like all my own money to shoot a 10 minute short film based around Mortal Kombat. And that was released virally on mistake, but it went viral. And then Warner Brothers saw it and then had me come into the office and then wanted to do a season of this digital series that would be online, which I found out later, like Chris told me he was watching it on the bus without, like, we never connected until he told me that. Chris from Cruella, then. Yeah. On, uh, he told me that on set or something like that. And that ended up becoming, like, the most popular YouTube series. And I think it, it spawned a lot of other things. Where was that hosted? It was on Machinima. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. And then. Because that was so popular, you started to see a lot of these other like video game IP turn into digital series. Like Halo came out with a live action thing. I believe Street Fighter is out right now. Um, and then I was working on the movie for a couple of years until I uh, until I left it to start kind of pursue other creative things. Just because you know three or four years of just Mortal Kombat was you know was kind of starting to get. Not mind-numbing, but just like I was running out of ideas. Right? You know, there, there, there reaches a certain point where you can only come up with so many unique ideas without like having it feel like a factory. So I left that, and I think literally immediately after that, I went and shot a video for Gorilla. Of course. Yeah. Um, and then we went and showed another, another video. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, but now, now I'm uh, attached to two movies. Um, outside of the studio system, because that's kind of like 
something that I've been really, really adamant about doing. You know, right now, like, and I'm sure this is the same thing within either the re the, the record industry as well, is that there is a system in the studio that's very hard to break. Like, there's a we know how to do this, and this is the way it's done. Um, and I think right now the future film business, as far as like the big, the bigger ones, like the big tent poles, they're either all remakes or they're superhero movies. Right? It's all about blockbusters. I was yeah. reading an article yesterday about how well independent artists are thriving. You know, a lot of people forget that Adele was originally on right. an independent label, and it was licensed out to a major eventually. Uh, so kind of that process of undergoing that creativity mm -hmm. independently. But then is the end goal to bring it to a major? Because that's always the challenge for me as a manager is we go, we create, you know, we've only done it a few times, but we've been successful in doing sure. it. We create this incredible story where the artist, you know, has their own world really in a sense. And then I have to decide, okay, do I continue to do this on my own yeah. or do I hand it over? And the second you hand it over, something starts to change. And it's so important to find the right partners that understand. But even when they understand, sometimes the system just doesn't. Well, the system is the system, right? It's like it's really difficult. And it's kind of the same in the feature film business. You know, with directors, there's a lot of time where they'll have a movie and then they'll just have like it's like an open assignment to directors to come in and basically audition for the movie. And that's a very, that's a very harsh creative process, right? Um, just as far as like the competitive spirit, at some point it's pretty good, but uh, when it comes to having it be too much, you kind of lose creativity and it just becomes about competition. Um, so I've been very interested in doing things outside of the outside of the studio system, uh, which is uh, something that people like Neil Blomkamp does very well. You know, he directed District Nine. Um, you know, obviously Tarantino like does whatever the hell he wants, right? Um, but even you know, like I think you know, Fincher went to a a financial company in order to fund like House of Cards, and then it ends up on Netflix. You know, um, and Blomkamp literally went. No, wasn't that wasn't House of Cards shot? There was like a pilot shot, and then no. that was sold. That no, they did the whole first the season. Whole thing. They funded the whole. That thing. That is amazing. And then Net and Netflix became the distribution. So with these things like Neil Blomkamp. You know, he goes and makes his movie, right? He makes his movies with private money, and then they basically, like, sell a negative pickup to the studio, and then the studio releases it. Hmm. So it's, it's what's cool about that is that it becomes, a, like, a wholly artistic, creative process where you just go and, like, you make your movie um, with the collaborators that you've chosen that are working for the benefit of the movie being better as opposed to like trying to figure out a corporate strategy. You know? So that's something I'm very Are you ever scared one of the one of the fears that we face? It's not a fear, we just have to always recognize the opportunity cost is if we're gonna do something on our own, we may not have that push. No. So is your goal you don't have that fear at all? Well no, of course you have that fear, but you know you I feel like if you don't take the risk I I've been lucky that when I've taken the risk it has definitely paid off more, both on a personal level and sometimes on a success level, because it, it the, the process They respect is, you more for having done it on your own. Yeah, and also I just feel like I operate the best when I feel like I'm creatively uh, allowed to do things. Not that I don't like uh, notes or... I love notes and collaboration, but sometimes when you're dealing with like studio executives, it's very different than dealing with artistic collaborators, right? Right. Like they're very different... Yeah, I'm sure District 9 will be a very different movie if yeah. you're in the studio system. Like there's very two, they're different. They serve two different purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, one is serving a corporate, you know, outcome, and one is for the benefit of the project. And whenever it's the benefit of the project, I definitely think the product comes out significantly more uh, authentic. Definitely. So, what is the what is the goal with these two movies as far as success is concerned? How do you measure success with? piece of art. Like well, I definitely, you know, obviously I want people to see the movie, but for me, I would, the movies that I've been very kind of encouraged by and inspired by, like, you know, Looper came out. I don't know if you saw Looper. I have not. Directed by Ryan Johnson, who did a lot of Breaking, who directed a lot of Breaking Bad. Um, but to do original ideas, like, I feel like that's something that's really lacking in the movie space. It's like literally original movie. Either, right now it's either big superhero movies or branded things that you've seen before, or 
remakes of IP that have existed forever, like Godzilla, you know? Um, but then there's not a lot of original content, and I don't think necessarily the feature film creative space will grow if it's just a bunch of remakes. The same, of the same things. Thing. I feel that way about dance music where, you know, yeah. I had to, for the panel that we have next week that Nathan and I have, you know, 20-something, it's like they talk about innovation. I feel like the festivals are innovating more than the artists themselves because the yeah. festivals feel that level of competition whereas a DJ can just come in, they pay 20, 50, 100,000 dollars just for, you know, putting in a disc. Well, and just on a production level too, I feel like there's become this like how to make electronic music. Of course. It's like, hey, if you want to sound like Calvin Harris and Avicii, your tempo is 128. If you want to sound like Skrillex, your tempo is 140. You know, like, it's like there's a step process. It's, it's so cookie cutter. Um, it's really insane. I mean, I'm sure even in the movie business, I've seen that article where they're, the posters, where they're just copying one another to make the same... It's literally trying to trick the audience into thinking that they're seeing the thing that they liked before. Right. So a lot of the movie posters now are like a person whose back is towards us, standing in front of like a bunch of chaos. But if you look at the 1970s and the 60s and even like Star Wars posters, those posters were like a work of art. Like every single one of them was like a painting that took forever. And like the poster for like The Shining is an artistic piece, where the poster for Scarface will always be iconic because it's you know got a thing going on. So yeah, that's kind of. It, it, it's kind of unfortunate that it's become this uh, this routine of of repeating itself. And you're going to be the guy to change it. Well, I, I mean, I want to be part of the part of the group that changes that thing. You know, I think the last group that I admire that came out of like that camp of of renegade, let's like, just start in a basement and do it on our own, was like Zotrope Studios, which was like George Lucas and Francis Ford Coppola and Martin Scorsese, like those guys literally were kind of known as the young grunty guys who ended up making The Godfather and Star Wars and like Casino and Goodfellas, right? They kind of broke the mold a bit and redefined what American cinema was back then. So I think, it, you know, that has to happen eventually again or else it's just going to be a lot of the same crap. So obviously, ten years ago, you were in a very different place, dancing on yeah. tours in Europe. And this man behind us, Kanye West, there's a video released today that I've only been able to watch eight minutes before my phone started going crazy in the middle of my workout. But um, it's called Kanye's New Testament. I think everyone oh, should go watch it. It's really, really cool. And Kanye says that he doesn't have one dream; is all dreams. He represents all dreams. And if you like Kanye West music, then you yeah. like yourself. And you know, just very. I know that he's always been super controversial, but um, an artist, yeah, he's an incredible artist. He stands up for what he believes in, and so you know, obviously, you can't probably limit it to just one. Somebody that's as talented as yourself mm -hmm. in so many different industries and roles. But ten years from now, what can we expect? Oh my God, it's like a Matthew McConaughey speech. Didn't, what do you, do you remember his Oscar speech about uh -huh, ten years ago? In ten years from now, you know, honestly, I. I am very ADD when it comes to all the things that I like to do. You know, obviously, I, I would love to still be doing the feature film stuff, um, but but the person who I admire as a brand mm -hmm. who has such great brand control and works in multiple mediums is J.J. Abrams. Like, he's got a company called Bad Robot, and Bad Robot is a brand. When you see that logo, you know exactly what you're getting. So his TV, his TV division is phenomenal. He still gets to produce television and get kind of creative in different elements and not feel tired by just focusing on one concept. And then he gets to go and make his movies at the same time. You know, something else that a lot of people don't know about J.J. is that he owns Ableton Live, and he composes every single theme song to his television shows. Wow. So I remember I went on the set of Star Trek one time, and in his like, director's chair was like a little Oxygen 8 MIDI keyboard. That I was like, why does he have that in his director's chair, but apparently I found out later, like, yeah, no, he's got Ableton, and he he's like So he's, he built Ableton? Founded Ableton? Uh, no, 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 he just bought Ableton. Like, I mean, oh. literally, like, owned, like, bought it as a consumer, oh, okay. yeah, and just okay. likes to play with music on his time off. So That's amazing. pretty cool, you know? Yeah, t talent can obviously come through in so many different ways, and I yeah. love when artists are able to take that ownership over a different aspect of their yeah. art and do an amazing job. I mean, David Fincher is another one who's like got a brand. The second you see this is a movie by David Fincher, like you kind of, you kind of know it's going to be awesome. House of Cards. I mean, it, House of Cards, Girl with Dragon Tattoo, Seven is still one of my favorite. Fight Club. I mean, like his roster is kind of perfect. It's amazing. So, well, you'll be next. 
Hopefully. Kevin, thanks for joining us on the show. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. We'll be giving away that pass in a couple minutes to EDM Biz next week. I will see you in Las Vegas, and we're actually still going to make sure that we get you your dose of 20-something live as well here live on thirdbrain.com. Thank you.